Hey, good morning. What a beautiful day it is to see you guys again. Uh, really quick, I want to let you guys know, I'm sorry I wasn't here last Sunday. I got sick, but I hope you guys had a blessed Sunday. I know that the message was awesome and full of power. On today, we are going to go ahead and worship the name of Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to go ahead and just tap into a new and a fresh experience with the Holy Spirit this morning. So wherever you're at, if you guys are on the stream, if you guys are in the congregation, we do thank you for being with us today. We are going to go ahead, not waste any time. We're going to jump in. We're going to go ahead and sing Worthy of It All. Um, sing your song to the Lord this morning. Let nothing stop you from singing your praise to Him this morning, okay? Oh, yeah. You worthy of it all. Can you help me sing that out? You were the of it all.
Jesus. You were the of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Can we praise the name of Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. Make some praise if he's worthy. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover If you don't sing it yet But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes it is I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Yes I do Still the miracle that Sons and daughters, we are bond with blood and washed in water. Sing it up, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from here to night. Let's praise me, wrote my story. We love his part. You know his testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. No. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. No. Greater things are still to come. Everybody, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. My Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm just else feel the presence of the Lord in the room right now? We thank you for being with us today, Lord. We admire you, Lord. We just worship you today, Lord God. Pour your spirit out, Lord. If 
you know this, can you sing this to me with the Father this morning? You guys sound absolutely beautiful. If you guys can sing it out just a little bit more this time, just a little bit more. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face.
in our life. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us and restoring us and renewing us, Father. God, this morning, we open our hearts to continue to receive of your word so that we as disciples may continue to grow in you, to become of a better testimony of who you are to those around us. Father, just fill us this morning. Fill us with your presence, Lord, so that we may leave this building, Lord, and continue to show others that there is nothing better than you that you are the one true God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Lord. And we just thank you, God, for who you are. 
Fill us, Lord, and open our hearts to welcome your word and to continue to set our eyes on you. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, church, you may be seated as you're doing. My name is Mike Harris. I am one of the pastors here at TAB. Just wanted to take a moment to welcome you this morning. Whether you're online on Facebook, viewing us through our podcast, or you're here in this room, we truly believe that you are at the right place at the right time with the right group of people. So just give yourselves a big hand for being here this morning. I also personally wanted to thank you for your contributions and your support sending myself, my wife, and the team to Kenya. We made it back this past week. Whew. Tab Church, you make a difference. We are pushing through boundaries to spread the gospel from Norfolk to the nations, and I am living proof of what you do and how it is effective and it's working. The second half of our team is going to finish up some of the things that COVID prevented us from being able to do, like a visa hearing for a young lady that we're hoping to bring back. But I bring good report that Michelle and Irene are home. They're doing great spending time with their family, and they'll be back with us shortly. If you are a first-time guest in the room, we have a special gift for you. So before you leave, right outside of the other wall here, just go and let them know that you're a first-time guest and we have a gift for you. I also wanted to let you know that next week we will have a tab talk, and that'll be August, uh, actually, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's not actually next week. August 8th, we'll have a tab talk at 11.30. And Tab Talk is where we just get to know you and connect with you. So if you want to know a little bit more about who Tab Church of Norfolk is, Tab Talk is where you'd come. You'd meet the pastoral team, and you'd meet our uh, uh, church team as well. So it's not just for new people. It's for anyone that has questions about who Tab is and how do I get connected. If you look behind your seats, there's a QR code. I don't know if you're familiar with QR codes, but you got to take your phone, put it on camera, shine it up against it. It's how we will connect with you through your prayers. You can also just fill out a prayer card. It's also another way where you can partner with us, of course, through your prayers, but also through tithes and through offerings. So if you do that, you can fill out the QR code and you can do it, or you can fill out one of those uh, forms right behind your seat and drop it off in the basket on your way out in front of your seat. Man, I appreciate you. Last thing that I want to make you aware of, we now have guest Wi-Fi. So everybody clap for that. So you can log in. There's uh, information all about it in the hallway somewhere. But if you desire to get on Wi-Fi now at Tab, you can as a guest. And that is it for my announcements. So if you can just take a look at the screen, Pastor Ed will be up in just a few minutes to continue on our series of preaching on the core values here at TAP, and I know he has an amazing word that's going to encourage our faith. Thank you. TAP Church exists to help the 1.7 million people in Hampton Roads discover their story in the context of God's global purpose. How do we do this? By pushing through boundaries to share God's story from Norfolk to the nations. And we have 10 core values that ensure we accomplish this mission. It's important that we know, embrace, and that we live out these values daily as a church family. One of our 10 core values is, we bend to the book. We reflect the reality of heaven. We're fueled by faith. We play the bench. We clear the path to Jesus. We do life together. We notice the unnoticeable. We inspire through grace. We export the best. We go all out. Good morning, Tab. It's so good to be with you this morning to be able to bring a word to you. Uh, pastor Craig, my pastor, your pastor, and Bethany are up in the children's uh, ministry, and that's why they are not here today. I'm so happy also to uh, just announce that my friend, um, Pastor Anthony Oles and First Lady uh, Tina Oles uh, have come to 
support us here, and so we're so glad to have you this morning with us. Thank you. Yeah. So for those who don't know me, many, many of you may be new, I'm a former pastor here at TAB, and so we continue on here as an elder, and from time to time they will call me when they get desperate, and, uh, and, and they'll ask me to preach. We're, we're going to continue our examination of core values here at TAB, and um, I, I, I tell you, I'm so appreciative of all those who are online and watching today, and we pray that God will bless you and keep you um, as we preach today. I've been assigned the important task of speaking to you about fueled by faith. This is a core value here at um, TAB, and we're going to examine this core value. There are two perspectives that you can have on faith today. The first place is the faith that is in our daily life and the place of faith in our community here at TAB. So as we look at faith, I'm going to be talking about you individually, but I'm also going to be talking about our church corporately. The phrase fueled by faith is really an intriguing um, um, phrase because it suggests that we're going to live our lives differently from those who are around us. And so the question for, before us today is, what is this thing called faith, and how do we get it, and, and what happens to our lives if we do not have faith? We are fueled by faith. In Ephesians 3 and 20 and 21, um, it says, now to him who is able to do more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And this is the passage of scriptures that the elders have put with this core value, fueled by faith. And with that is this statement that you see up on the screen. We believe it's God's desire to do exceedingly more. We go boldly before a gracious God who eagerly responds to the faith of his people, knowing that without faith it is impossible to please God, and we seek to be a people marked boldly, by bold faith. Our corporate and personal stories will give witness to our great God who defies natural limits and human ability. This is the statement that we publish at TAB and into the community about this particular core values. Now, there are two ways that you can look at faith. The first way is to look at it doctrinally. So it is the faith. And in order to have the personal faith, we must first come with the faith. The things that we believe, the things that are written in Scripture, the faith. And then it is the faith that we think of when we think of walking around. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the scripture um, gives a definition of this doctrinal faith, and it's interesting how it's defined and how the Bible translates this in the different translations. So one translation says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Listen to this translation. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Here's another one. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. And so you see, there are many different ways that we can translate that, but the bottom line is that faith is, our, is the foundation of all that we believe. So this faith that I'm speaking of today is the faith that fuels us. It is what I would call the walking around faith. 
It is the faith that you and I are expected to have. It is the common currency of our Christian life. It's what drives us. It's, it's the energy, the fuel of our relationship with God. And it's what makes us different from all those who are around us. For in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards them. He rewards those who seek him. To put it another way, without faith, you can't have a relationship with God. And this is important for you who, who walk with the Lord, that when you come to that time and those places where you fail to trust him and have faith in him, that causes your relationship with him to wane. Now, that doesn't mean that you lose that relationship. But God expects that you would trust him so it's the common currency of our relationship. Faith is so important to our Christian life that we must understand how to cultivate it, how to grow it. Jesus put a high premium on faith. He commended those who had faith, and, and he, he warned those of little faith. And so notice in the Scripture how Jesus speaks of those who have faith and who they are. Isn't it interesting that the ones who have the great faith are those who are little in that society? It would be the Gentiles and the women and the children. They are often said to have the greatest faith, even greater than the disciples themselves. And so as we talk about this issue of faith, I would like for us to go to the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And many of you may know of the story of Gideon or have a, a vague familiarity with that story. I want you to think about this story of Gideon. Now, this is a true story. It is a historical story. It is a narrative about the walking around faith that I'm speaking about and the faith that you must have in order to please God. Now understand that, let me put in context where we are in the history and the life of Israel. For this is the time of the judges. For you will remember in your Old Testament that God led Israel out of Egypt. And he led them into the promised land. And they, they were able to defeat the seven nations, the Canaanite nations that were in the promised land. And as long as Joshua was on the scene, they lived victoriously in obedience and faith to the Lord. But once Joshua came off of the scene, the children of Israel began to worship false gods in direct violation to what God had, had asked them and told them to do. And eventually, because they were worshiping these false gods, God allowed their enemies to prevail over them. And, these, and this enemy then would cause them to suffer greatly. And they began to, in their suffering, cry out to the Lord. And when they would cry out to the Lord, believing that God would hear them, God would send a deliverer, whom we call a judge. And so they entered into this cycle and the cycle was one of retribution, rebellion, because they rebelled against God by worshiping false gods. Then God would send retribution, which was the nations around them would attack them. 
And then the people, because of their suffering, would repent. And then God would send a judge along who would defeat that enemy and the people would be restored. And then they would seek reformation. They would follow God. So there was this cycle that continuously repeated itself in the life of Israel. Now this is a cycle that may be familiar to some of us. That we too have had these times in which we walk with the, with the Lord. We have trusted him and believed in him. And then we fall away. We fall away from God. The world gets our attention. And God allows difficulty to come into our life. And when that difficulty comes, we repent. And, it is, and, 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 and when we repent, God then delivers us. And in that deliverance, he also brings about restoration. Have you been through that cycle? I've been through that cycle many times. And I know that many of you have been through that cycle. And this was the cycle that was in, that Israel was in at this time. The Word of God tells us in the book of Judges in chapter 6 that the Israelites were following after the Baals, the false gods. So God raised up the Midianites and the Amalekites. The Midianites and the Amalekites were these nomadic tribes that came from the far east beyond the Red Sea. And the scripture describes them as, as in number as like the sand of the sea. And they came and they would come periodically and attack Israel. And let me tell you when they attacked them. They attacked them at the time of harvest, when the crops were ripe. And they would come into the land and the Israelites would flee to the mountains, to caves. And the Midianites would strip the land clean of its crops and all of their animals and their produce. And so the people were impoverished and they were suffering greatly. God allowed the nation to become destitute. But it was in this destitution and in this poverty that the people cried out to the Lord. And they cried out for help to the Lord. And God sent a prophet. Now think word of God, because the prophet brings the word of God. And the prophet said, you have not obeyed the voice of God. That's why you're suffering. Now the prophet told them this, but he didn't tell them how he was going to deliver them. And so when we begin to look at the life of Israel and understand what God is doing, the first thing we must remember and understand is, is that when we entertain sin, we diminish our faith. It causes our faith to become little. Because you see, sin will blind us and deceive us. It will ravish us and leave us destitute, devoid, and depressed. And sadly, you won't be able to trust God. You won't be able to be empowered by his spirit because of that sin. But you know, our faith becomes stronger when we walk with him. It only becomes weak when we leave him behind. And so in that passage of scripture, the word of God says that the children of Israel, and God uses a shockingly vivid term, it's shocking. He says they went 
whoring, whoring after other gods, their idols. They engaged in spiritual prostitution. And of course, you know, this type of idolatry didn't end with Israel. It's alive in it as well today. So you see, sin can make us streetwalkers and pimps. Spiritual streetwalkers, spiritual streetwalkers and pimps following after sin and the desires of this world and the desires of the great deceiver, Satan. So you cannot be a man or woman of sin, of faith. You cannot be a man or woman of faith and dabble in sin. Because faith requires holiness. Faith requires holiness. Now, Jesus revealed this to his disciples. You see, Peter was the first to say that you are the Messiah, you are the Lord. And then not long after that, to, get you, to give you an example of where Peter was in his own spiritual life, the Lord says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I will be persecuted and crucified. And Peter says to the Lord, oh no, no, this, this is not going to happen to you. We're, we're, we're not going to let, this is not going to be the case. We're not going to do this. And the Lord said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Wow. What was that all about? You see, Peter's sin was hindering his call to take up the cross in the way that Jesus took up the cross. You have to understand what's going on there. You see, the disciples saw Jesus as the Messiah who would come and reign royally right at that time, that he certainly wasn't going to go to the cross, and if he was going to reign royally, then we're going to reign with him, and we're going to have our position and power and perks and privileges. He didn't want to hear anything about the cross. And this is one of the reasons why the disciples struggle with faith it was because of their own sin. So you see, if we are going to trust the Lord, we must be holy. And this is where walking around faith comes. But let me hasten to add that if we are going to have this faith both individually, we must have it corporately. Tab Church must trust God, must have walking around faith. Tab Church. You see, if we don't have walking around faith, what makes us different from any other place? We're just a corporation. We're just a business, a gathering of people. And the world doesn't need any more corporations. What they need is a group of people, an assembly of God who are being led by God in faith. That's what they need. But you see, God is also calling his people to live righteous and holy lives. This is a walking around faith the congregation must embrace. See, because you see, it takes faith for the church to say, we're not going to condone sin. People don't want to hear that today. Church wants to grow. And so there are many churches that are not going to make those types of statements. You see, it takes faith to be able to say that 
No, we won't. With humility and with patience and with long suffering, to say no, we will not accept that behavior in our midst. So it takes faith. It takes faith to take a large part of your revenue and use it for missions and, and helping people in different cultures to come to understand who God is, to send others to those cultures. It takes faith to reach out to the poor and the widow and the orphan and those living and hanging out on the margins of life to, to, to be able to reach out to them with our resources. It takes even more faith to reach out to the sojourner and the oppressed and the homeless in this political environment. It takes faith to do that. And it takes faith to, it takes faith for you to come here and to worship in the midst of a pandemic. Even though you have your shots, it still takes faith to do that. And I'm, you know, those who decide that they don't want to be vaccinated, God bless you. Those who are vaccinated, God bless you. But it takes faith to come here. Because God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And you and your wisdom have understood that, and you have come and you are worshiping. Even in the midst of these difficult times, that is a demonstration of faith because you believe that providence can overcome pestilence, and that's what this is all about. And a church that, that, that pursues purity will be a church that, who can trust the Lord. You see, when Pastor Cray came, he looked back in history. He looked at what the church had faith to believe in in times past. We all look back. And that was a thing that we needed to do because it will inform what we do going forward. I want you to know that I, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I know that God has things that will test us. He has things that will, in which we will have to believe. And we will have faith when we stand in purity before him. And make no mistake, Jesus is watching. Jesus is looking at what we're doing here. He's paying attention. Just go read about the seven churches in Revelation. And notice God's call to them for obedience and purity. Notice that he calls out those churches that don't follow, and he threatens them. What happens to a church that fails to exercise this kind of faith? Christ eventually walks away from the church. And as he walks out of the church, he turns out the lights. And we will be left rejoicing and praising the Lord in darkness. There are many churches today who are doing just exactly that because they refuse to trust God. And so as we look at this, this, this story of Gideon, we also see not only this call to purity, but the, the word of God and the nexus of the word of God and faith. The word of God is foundational to faith. 
Thus says the word of God. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. That's what the text says. You see, we listen to what God says to us. Do you know when you pick up your Bible and you read the word of God, that that's God speaking to you? God is speaking to you. You're having a conversation with the Lord, and the Lord is speaking to you. And if, if you know him and are in a relationship to him, he is speaking to you. That's the great value of the word of God, that that word which was written 2,000 years ago is though God wrote it today because God speaks through it. And God knows who you are, and he knows everything about you. So the Spirit of God knows how to apply that word to your life. It's an amazing thing. So that this same word that I read speaks to me in a way that is different from how it speaks to you. We have the interpretation is correct, but the application of the word becomes different. The word of God, it speaks to our faith and it trains and helps us to believe. You know, the Gideons understood that. The organization called the Gideons understand that. And that's the reason why they endeavor to put Bibles everywhere. They have Bibles, they're, they're or, the Gideon has distributed Bibles in over 200 nations. You know, our own Glenn Patton, our deacon and elder here, he is the vice president of the Gideon's Norfolk camp, and he understands the importance of Bible distribution. So our walk around faith is grounded in the Word of God. So let's look and see how that works. We're going to look at it from a number of different scripture passages. You know, our Heavenly Father tells us in Proverbs, in Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, you know, many of you claim this as a life verse. If someone were to say to you, what is one of your favorite verses, you would, you would quote this verse. But you know, there's some great promises in this passage. Are you able to hold on to those promises when things go wrong? I was talking to Sharon Swink uh, last week, and she, was, she shared with me about Dr. Helen Rosevere, a medical missionary from Ireland, who in 1953, having received her medical uh, degree, went to the Congo. And she, she went not just to the Congo, but deep inside of the Congo, such that the place where she finally landed was a good 150 miles away from uh, anyone being able to reach her. And there she began to set up medical clinics in that community. And, and she set up about 125 clinics all through the Congo. And my guess is, is that this verse, Proverbs 3, five and six would be a verse that she would claim. And there was a time, she, she relates this story of having delivered a child and this woman died in the process of delivering this child prematurely. And this baby was born just two pounds. And the water bottle that they would use to warm this baby burst. So they had to keep that baby near a fire or the baby would die. So Dr. Rosevere and a 10-year-old that she claims that she got, and there was a two-year-old that was the mother's child as well. So the mother had a two-year-old and a two-pound infant 
and the mother died. So Dr. Rosevere began to pray and told that 10-year-old, you must pray with me that this baby will survive the night and that we've got to keep her close to the fire. And that 10-year-old prayed a prayer. She said, Lord, send another water bottle and a doll baby for the two-year-old. And now that 10-year-old didn't, I mean, you know, she didn't know that you're not supposed to pray prayers like that. Doesn't make sense. How is God going to get a water bottle and a doll baby to them out in the middle of the jungle, 150 miles away from civilization? The next morning, there arrived a package from the United Kingdom that a friend had sent her. And among the items in that package was a water bottle and a baby doll. That package was sent five months earlier. It took five months to get there. But God knew, and that 10-year-old believed. Oh, the faith of a 10-year-old. She had walking around faith. And Dr. Rosevere had walking around faith. And it's the kind of faith that comes because you believe what God says in his word. In 1964, war broke out in the Congo. And the war came to her camp. And she was severely beaten and raped. And yet, she said, God, ask her this question. Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even though I may never tell you why? Now, that is a profound question. You should write that question down. Because, see, you see, that question you may one day have to answer as well. Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, the experience of being abused and beaten and raped, even though I may not, never tell you why? You see, she did not have despair. She did not... She did not fall away from the Lord. She believed. She had a Job experience, and you know about Job. Job lost his entire family, his entire wealth, and his body was wrecked with sickness and illness. And when his friends saw him, they wept. They wept for seven days. Job then said, it would have been better for me never to have been born. And yet even though Job questioned God, he says in Job 19, 25 and 26, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet my flesh, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job believed. He answered that question. God never told him why he would agree to do those things. And yet Job believed. You see, as Christians, our outcomes are not necessarily the rosy garden. There will be times when deliverers will not rescue us. The book of Hebrew tells us of the giants of the faith who were stoned, who were sawed in two, who were killed with the sword. They went about with skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens, caves of the earth. They were fueled by faith. A faith, then, that is indestructible. How does this work work? The Word of God 
speaking to our faith. In Matthew 6, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more than they? So tell me. Do you have faith to believe what God has said there? In particular, you who are struggling financially, trying to figure it all out, trying to figure out where it's all going to come from. God is calling you to trust him. And the word is replete with these type of calls of promise to his people. Have you been, have you been wrong? Have you been mistreated? God says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know what you need to do when somebody really abuses you and offends you and does you wrong? You better pray for them, because God neither sleeps nor does he slumber. God doesn't take naps, and he sees, and he's going to repay. And whether he repays in this life or the life to come, he's going to repay because God keeps his promises. Do you believe that? See, because if you don't believe that, you will become bitter and you will become angry. This is how the word of God informs our faith. God responded to Gideon with a promise. And this is God's promise to us as well, that he will help us to overcome in the battle. And you see, when you don't trust God, you run the risk of leaving God out of the equation. And when you leave God out of the equation of life, you're going to always come up with a big fat zero. You'll never win. This is why Paul says, for you consider, brothers, not many wise, not many according to worldly standards, not many powerful, not many of the noble birth, but God chose what is foolish and what is shameful and what is weak and not the strong. Why does he do that? Because you see, these are the people who trust God because they must. It's either they trust God or they die. There's not many options here. So Gideon says to the Lord, but Lord, how can I save Israel Behold, my clan is the weakest, and I am the least in my father's house. You see, what you're seeing then is the issue of Gideon's character. Now, many of you think of Gideon as being this mighty, courageous warrior. And in fact, the text tells us that the angel of God appears before him, and this angel of God starts out with this um, this statement that says that he is a, 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 a very man of valor, a man of courage. It says that the angel of the Lord saw him in that way. Oh, mighty man of valor. Don't be fooled. That was a prophetic statement. Gideon is actually a wimp. He is actually a wimp. Now notice what happens. First of all, God comes to Gideon. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. Gideon offers him food, and God causes fire to come down from heaven and devour that, and then he disappears. A miracle, right? So then God tells to Gideon, you are going to be the deliverer of Israel. I'm going to send you to deliver my people from the Midianites. Gideon says, well, Lord, um, if you're going to send me, um, 
I have this fleece, this wool, and I'm going to put it out on the ground, and the next morning, if you're going to really deliver me and be behind me, I would like for you to make this fleece so wet that it's wet and that it would fill, the, when I wring it out, it will fill a bowl with water. God does that. Next morning, the fleet is completely soaked. Gideon says, okay. He says, okay, well, Lord, don't be angry with me. An indication that what he's doing is sinful because he's really testing God. And he says, well, Lord, cause that fleece to be dry and everything around it be wet. So God does that. And you see, the Lord said to Gideon, go and pull down the bales. Gideon does it, but when does he do it? He does it at night because he's afraid. And so in one last concession, God says to Gideon, if you go into the, if you sneak into the camp of the enemy and listen, so Gideon and his servant sneaks into the camp without them knowing that he's there, and he listens, and he hears one Midianite say to another Midianite, I had a dream that this tent fell. And the other Midianite said, I know the interpretation of that dream. Gideon is going to prevail in battle. Gideon heard that. Then the Lord says to Gideon, I want you to, I want you to whittle down your forces. You've called all the nation of Israel out, and there's a million people out there. That's too many, because you see, when I give you the battle, you're going to think that you did it. And isn't this so with us? We start out poor have barely enough money to feed our families. We are praying to God that he would provide for us, and we learn by faith that God will provide for us, and he'll take care of us, and, and God does that. Years later, we have come to a place of prosperity and goodness, and we stop praying because we don't think we really need God after all. You know, we got a bank account. You know, we have all that we need. We got insurance. Why do we need to pray? And you see, what God was saying to, to Gideon is, even if you have all these people, you can't win this battle, so we might as well just whittle this force down. And Gideon whittled it down to 300. And then the Lord said, now I want you to surround the camp, each man with his candle in his jar, and a trumpet. And in the middle of the night, when the enemy is asleep, I want you to sound the trumpet, break the glass, show the light. The enemy wakes up. They think that each light is a legion of soldiers. They are running in confusion, this multitude of people. They begin to attack one another. God wins the battle. You see, what is needed is an understanding of our inadequacy and our insufficiency and our weakness and our poverty. And when we come to that place that we don't have what we need, that helps to cultivate us because it causes us to look to God. Gideon won that battle, but still Gideon didn't trust the Lord because the Lord said, send the people home. Gideon calls the people back. As they are rushing and fleeing, Gideon calls the nation forward. Those 300 could have done the job. You see, our, the Lord expects us in the middle of our weaknesses to trust him. Look at what happens with the disciples. And, and you see the patience of the Lord with Gideon? 
He asked God over and over again to give him a sign. That was a sinful thing. But God was patient with him and loving with him. Look at what happens with his disciples. This tells you that this happens to you and me as well, and God is patient with us. For his disciples were discussing about the fact that they had no bread when they were with Jesus. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? God's frustrated. This is called a holy frustration. And sometimes God gets frustrated with us. Let me, go, let me be God's anger translator if I, will be, if I could. I'm going to be God's anger translator. This is, this is how we would say it. What's wrong with you knuckleheads? What? what What's, what's the problem? Are you blind? Are you deaf? Have you lost your mind? How many times do I have to tell you this? This is the holy frustration that God has with us. Now think back. Think back in your own life. How many times have you prayed and God delivered you? And yet, things can happen to you today and you have the same response you had 20 years ago. God's not pleased with that. So God tells his people repeatedly to remember. This is the reason why there are festivals, that Israel had all of these festivals. God tells the people to remember, and God is telling you to remember. And so when you pray tonight, think back how God has delivered you and thank him for that, for that is remembering. And when you do that, you strengthen your faith. You remember, you remember that God got you into that college. You remember that God sent you things when you most desperately needed it. You remember when God delivered you from this sickness or this illness. You remember when God gave you the grace to go through a dark passage. And see, what this points to is another core value here at TAB that we um, don't have as our written core value. And it's a core value that we, we might need to consider adding to our official core values, and that is the core value of prayer. We lift up holy hands. You see, Gideon's discussion with God is a parallel to prayer. We can have those same discussions with God as we pray. And if we are going to have the faith that God expects for us, the walking around faith, we must also pray. Our faith brings God glory. You know, God whittled the forces of Gideon down to 300 in order that he might be glorified. God allowed him to have this great victory so that people would say, it is the Lord who did this thing. God wants to be glorified in your life. He wants to receive praise as the result of the things that he does for you. And so I would say to you, saints, that when you trust the Lord, you bring glory to him. When you are fueled by faith and when you are walking around in faith, you bring glory to God. And the world 
will come to know God because of your faith. All over the world of that time, God was known because of his deliverance of the children of Israel from Pharaoh and Egypt and from God bringing them through the Red Sea. All over the world, people glorified God because of what he did. All over the world, people glorify God because of what he did through Helen Roosevelt. All over the world, people glorify God for what he has done through this congregation. Do you know you can go, there is not very many places in the world that has not been touched by Tabernacle Church of Norfolk. People know of this congregation. They know of this place. And they have thanked God for what he has done in the life of this church. And God desires that he be able to do that in your life as well. Let us close with a word of prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, I know that there are those in our congregation who are going through difficult passages as we speak. Lord, I pray that they will understand that though their way be difficult, you expect them to walk in faith, trusting you, believing that you are and that you will reward them and that if that reward isn't seen in this life, it will be in eternity where it will matter the most. And Lord, I know that in the life of this church there will come the challenges in which we will have to step by faith. And I pray that the people of God here at Tabernacle Church will be able to look back and say, the same God that sent missionaries all over the world, the same God that establishes churches throughout the Hampton Roads area, the same God who has worked through organizations like UDM and you know, Triple R Ranch and Norfolk Christian and on and on, this same God is the God whom we serve. And if he could do those things in the past, he can do those things in the future. Lord, I pray that our people would have that kind of faith and they would live their lives in such a way that that faith would grow. Bless this congregation, Lord. Thank you for the examples of faith that we have right here. People whom we look to, Lord, and praise you because of their faith. And people who mentor us in their faith. Right here in this congregation, Lord. Men and women who are giants in the faith. Lord, I pray that you will bless this congregation to grow in that area. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Tab Church. All right, we're going to go ahead and invite the Discovery team up to the front. prayer or anything, you're more than welcome to come and talk to one of our Discovery team members. They are more than welcome to pray with you. We're going to go ahead and uh, enter into one more song for a time of worship. If you want to stand, you're more than welcome. If you guys want to stay seated again, you're more than welcome. This is going to be a little hype, though. I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys that a little bit. Why would I worry when giants come calling my name? My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. You know, yeah, sing it out with me. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than 
in all of these things. If you know this, can you sing this to me? And I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I Cause they go the battle is God. Yes, it is. My God is stronger. The victory's already won. Yeah, he died for my ransom and rose up on the third day. Yeah. Put your hands out this morning. Lord God, we just come before you right now, Lord Jesus, just saying thank you, Lord. Just thanking you for allowing us to be a part of your big picture, Father God. As individuals, Lord, we bless you. Lord, I ask that your presence right now in the name of Jesus under the sound of my voice would just extend to every person in this room, Lord, every person on the streams, Father God, wherever they're watching at right now, I ask that you would just give them a touch, Lord God, whether it's in their heart or in their mind, Father. I just ask that your presence would resonate with your spirit today, Father God. I ask that as you send your people out from this place today, Lord, into their workplaces, into their, their schools, Father God, that they would be ambassadors for your kingdom in the highest fashion, Lord God. We love you and we thank you. We declare it in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you guys may uh, be dismissed. Have a blessed week, everybody.